Good morning. This is not the way we planned this weekend, but if we remember with humility to say, Lord willing, after we make our plans, this is these are the kind of things we need to do. Um, sorry, we can't meet together in person today, but uh, when I went out at nine o'clock, it was already icing over pretty well. Uh, just to, just one announcement about the rest of the a week, uh, about the rest of the plans today. Uh, we are still planning on having the youth event tonight at 630. And obviously, because we're not meeting at church, we can't have pizza with families after service. So we're inviting families of uh, children and teens um, to join us at five o'clock for some pizza. And at around 630, the youth meeting will start. So those are the events of the day. I will be sending out an email with um, uh, all the other announcements like we do every week anyway. So I'll explain that a little bit more at the end. Our search committee began in May and we divided into subcommittees, a candidate search committee, a subcommittee finances and compensation packet subcommittee and job duties and priorities. The first can candidate search through youth specialties website and colleges that we sought to connect with yielded no candidates that we wanted to follow up with throughout the summer. In the fall, we posted on a new website called Church Staffing, and we found two candidates that we chose to interview. My first contact with Matthew was November 1st, phone call that um, we had a great time. Uh, it, it went for a good hour and a half. And uh, then we had the two interviews on November 12th. Both candidates were godly men. Uh, uh, we selected the one that we felt best fit where our vision is going as a church. The whole committee discussed those interviews and we decided to invite Matthew to come and candidate. Before this weekend, Matthew, being a diligent student, got his... Uh, projects done and said he could join us for December 3rd through 5th and he came shared his testimony went to the tree decorating party and was here for the uh, fundraising breakfast for sink recovery and it was just a good weekend to meet him um, face to face well this weekend due to COVID cases and weather we had no idea how many adjustments we would make I have been blessed by Matthew and Alethea Alethea is his fiance their flexibility Friday night they met with a small numbers because of some people being sick. Saturday morning, the whole search committee minus a few was there and then others were invited afterwards. It was a very productive time. Nancy and I had a chance to meet with them for lunch and the Harrisons have been hosting them all weekend. And then the elders and trustees met with them last night. Well, this morning we've asked Matthew to share in a message and uh, Obviously, we're doing this on Zoom and we'll be posting it, uploading it to YouTube to give as many people a chance to hear uh, his heart. And uh, I remind you, as I open up in a word of prayer, this isn't about Matthew because we're worshiping. We're here to talk about our love for the Lord. And I hope that that comes through when you hear Matthew and the many answers to the many questions he's received. So many times he starts with, well, you pray. <laughs> That, that phrase has come up many times in his answers. So I'm gonna pray and I'll turn it over to Matthew and Aletheia to introduce themselves and for Matthew to share with us this morning. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are the builder of your church, Jesus. You said you would build your church. We thank you for the history here at Bethel. We pray that we maintain our commitments to you and to your word and to the discipleship calling we have as we wait for your return, Jesus. I pray that you'll bless us this uh, challenging morning with the ice, keep, keep people safe and keep people well, and just bless our time now as we uh, listen uh, to what Matthew and Aletheia have to say as they introduce themselves and, and uh, open the word and just share with us um, what your calling is in, in his life and in their lives. I thank you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew? Well, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's uh, got a nice, lovely, warm drink on this icy morning, whether that's coffee, tea, or hot chocolate. Um, again, my name is Matthew, 
Um, I'll be kind of doing the message today. I just kind of want to introduce myself. Um, I'm going to slide this monitor over. This is Alethea. Um, this is my fiance. Hi, I'm Alethea. <laughs> um, I'm also a Liberty grad. I just graduated with my degree in forensic science. Yeah, so we're just, we've been here for a few days and we're just, we're so excited to be here. So the last time I was here, um, I actually had the opportunity to share my testimony um, with the congregation. And today uh, I have this amazing opportunity where I get to share a little bit more about my call to ministry, about how the Lord had opened up the, this door for an opportunity to serve in full-time vocational ministry focused in, in the youth. And so where we, where we left off was in 2016 in April, uh, I gave my life to Christ. It was an absolutely amazing opportunity to be involved in that. And just a couple months later, uh, in November of 2016, I actually moved to uh, Bakersfield, California, which if anyone has moved or has been anywhere near Bakersfield, California, uh, to summarize it, it is hot and it is in the middle of a desert. <laughs> and it is way down south in California. And so when I was there, I attended a high school called Frontier High School. And I stayed there uh, from my junior year all the way until senior year where I graduated from it. And when I was there in 2017, I began looking for colleges. And when I was looking at colleges, I was looking all throughout California and Liberty actually wasn't on my radar. Um, so I looked at different areas, whether that was uh, California Baptist, I was looking at Concordia, even a university called Masters. And when I was there, I was looking through all these colleges and none of them seemed right because I was looking um, through physical therapy, which was the major I was trying to go into, um, as well as youth ministry as a backup. And to evaluate that a little bit further, I was looking at youth ministry as a job and nothing more. I looked at it as an opportunity to serve with kids, but that was it. And so in 2017, in the summer of 2017, I actually visited U Liberty University and I actually didn't like it. <laughs> so when I first came to Liberty, I didn't like it. Um, I thought it was too big, it was too big of a school and I thought it was kind of crazy. And, um, but well, the more I was there and the more I was walking around the, the campus and the tour, I started interacting with the staff and I interacted with some of the professors that we saw there. And I began to fall in love with it. I started to see the community. So in August 1st of 2017, I actually applied to Liberty University. And in August uh, or August 25th of that same year, I got accepted. So it was the first school I applied to, and it was the only school I applied to, and it was the first one I got back with me, which was a whole year before I even started school, which was would have been in August of 2018. So flash forward, or flash forward all the way to 2018 in August when I came to Liberty University, it was a huge culture shock. So being in California, it was a lot of different culture than what we have seen in Virginia, right? Because it's 3,000 miles away. And one of the funniest things that ever happened was when I was there, I walked into a room with a bunch of divinity majors and other people that have grown up in the church when I didn't grow up in the church. And I walked in and some of the things I said completely confused them because it was not the culture that they were used to and it wasn't the culture I was used to either. And so it was, it was a huge culture shock. And the more I was there, uh, the more I started to see some awesome things about Liberty, the community. Uh, because believe it or not, when I, was, when I became saved in 2016, I was not discipled. I was actually not trained. Um, and it, it was hard. And so when I came to Liberty, I knew nothing about my own faith. And I was a physical therapy major. But the more I was at Liberty, the more things began to change. And what ended up changing was my heart for ministry. And I began to, to value what Jesus valued. And that's kind of what I want to go through today. And that's, it's this question. It's what, what does Jesus value? Does he, does he value life? Does he, does he value uh, cursing? Does he value cancel culture that we see a lot today? What does he value? And so the first point that we're going to go to is that Jesus values people. 
And so when I came to Liberty, as I said before, I wasn't discipled. And the first class I took was a class called Evangelism 101, which is pretty much a class on how to share the gospel. And we learned a lot about the life of Jesus and how Jesus interacted with people. And one day I was in class and we went through a passage called, uh, it was in John 4. And this passage, when we read through it, it blew my mind. And a little background context behind John 4. Uh, so Jesus was going through Samaria and he stopped in a place called Sychar, which is considered a shorter route. And a little historical context behind that was the Jews um, tended to not go near this area because there was a distrust or a dislike between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. And I love the way the New King James Version says this in John 4, verse 4, and it says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go. And why? Because people needed to hear the good news. And so we're going to start here. If you see me kind of veer off right here, my Bible's right here. I can't say it right here, but in verse 6, it says this. It says that Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. And it was about noon. So Jesus, from his long journey, decided to, to rest in this area. And when he sat down, this woman approached the well. And this was an unusual time for, for individuals or for women to come to this well. And as we learn further in the story, I can't go fully through the chapter because there's so much I want to go through, is it's uh, she actually had five husbands previously, and the person that she was currently with was not her husband. And during this time, she was here, and Jesus was having a conversation with her. And when she came to drink water, Jesus asked her for a drink. We see that in verse 7 where it says, When those Samaritan women came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And what we see in this awesome context is we see Jesus having a conversation with this woman. He was valuing, he was having a conversation. He wasn't just going in there and be like, no, I'm resting. I don't want to be involved. He wanted to talk with her. He was having a conversation with her. And what did she do? She ended up challenging him. She was asking him questions because she didn't know. And as we go further in the story, verse 13 says, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will come and become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. We just see so much love that Jesus is having with this individual. And once she has this conversation with Jesus, in the very end, we see that Jesus, uh, or that the woman says, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. It's what we see in this context. And I want you guys to read John 4. Because there's a lot more that I can unpack there, but I got to move on. But when you look at this passage, you're seeing so much love that Jesus is showing to these people. And the woman, after that she had talked with Jesus, she left her water jar after talking with Jesus and let, went back to the town to share the good news. She was interacting and responding to what Jesus was telling her. And that's what it's all about. Jesus values people. And during my class, when we were reading this chapter, I was absolutely blown away by the love Jesus was showing to people because this was one of the first times I was re I was the first time I ever read John 4, and it blew me away. I came home to because uh, I was living on the hill, residential, and me and my roommate sat down, and we talked about it for days. I came in like a little kid in a candy store. I was so excited. To talk about this passage because I thought it was so unique and it had a huge, huge influence on my life because during that time when I was engaging with scripture and I was looking through it God started doing something in my heart he started changing it and now all of a sudden I started valuing people 
And furthermore, I started valuing God's word. And that's our next point we're going to dive into is that Jesus values the word. So when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, Jesus combated Satan with scripture. We see that in the correlation that he was using, he was quoting the book of Deuteronomy. So when he says that man shall not live off of bread alone, he was quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. When he says, you shall, you shall serve him or God and only him, Deuteronomy 6.13. Deuteronomy 6.16, do not put your God to the test. When Jesus was interacting, when he was in the wilderness and being tempted by Satan, Jesus responded in every action through the word. Deuteronomy was actually one of the most was the uh, the most book that he used throughout his ministry journey. And 2 Timothy chapter 3:16 shows that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We see that scripture is powerful, scripture is moving. And when I was at Liberty, I began to read God's word every single day. And I was excited. I was reading passages I have never seen before. And people were like, you've never read that passage? I was like, no, have you? And they're like, yeah, I read it every day. But there's something about reading scripture one time, two times, 50 times, and you get so excited when seeing it. And Jesus values the word. We also see in Hebrews 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, it says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, jointing and or joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Scripture is so amazing to be involved with. Now, when I was in my classes and I was going through Old Testament and I was going through evangelism, I I was nervous because when we were doing projects and we had to study scripture, whether that was 2 Timothy or even Genesis 1.1, I didn't know what I was reading at first, but what was amazing about it was the Lord was opening up my mind to seeing what that scripture was and applying it into my heart and knowing what the word was and applying it into my life every single day. And through that, when I was getting through my call to ministry slowly through, because as I told you guys before, my original major was therapeutic science. But I was taking some gen eds and evangelism and Old Testament. And at this moment, when I started reading God's word, my heart started changing. I started having compassion for the lost. And I started caring for God's word. And I started training myself, learning. I was seeking guidance from RSs, which are resident shepherds. And I was seeking guidance from my my peers who knew God's word. It was so much fun. The next point that I really want to get into is that Jesus values prayer. So when God was working in my life and started changing my heart into being wanting to serve in full-time vocational ministry, I was terrified. I didn't know what I was doing. I was fearful and afraid that since I wasn't trained and I didn't know what I was doing, that I, I was nervous. And so what I had to do was I had to pray so much to God because I needed his guidance. And we see that Jesus values so prayer so much that he often went to be alone to pray and be in communication with the Father. Matthew 26, verse 36 states that Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He separated himself so that he could pray and be in communication. Later in verse 39, scripture states that Jesus Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, not yet not as I will, but as you will. We see in Scripture that Jesus values prayer. And not only in the New Testament do we see prayer being implemented. In the Psalms, uh, as you all know, Psalms is one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love the Psalms. And um, we see a lot in the Psalms, uh, particularly with David, we see when David was praying, there was a certain form of how he was praying. There were different ways that he prayed. And Psalm 143 verse 1 says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy and your faithfulness and righteousness. Come to my 
relief. Psalm 143, verse 8, it says, Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for I entrust, or for you, for to you I entrust my life. Sorry about that. Have y'all ever felt that way? How, have y'all ever felt when you prayed that you, you, you were getting ready to do something that you didn't know? Maybe it was buying a house. Maybe it was talking to an unbeliever. Maybe it was you're getting ready to do something that you, you don't know what the outcome is going to be like. And your response is, God, I don't know what I'm doing. And I, I'm praying to you. Uh, there's other Psalms that we can list. Psalm 5, listen to my words. Psalm 17, I call on you. Psalm 86, hear me, Lord, and answer me. Psalm 141, verse 1 and 2, I call to you, come quickly to me. Hear me when I call you. Have y'all ever felt that way? I mean, I have. I'll be vulnerable here. I have. When I was going through my degree, I was and going into transitioning to go into youth ministry, I was terrified. Here I was, an 18-year-old student who had barely been in the word very long. And now all of a sudden I'm stepping into something I'm not, I'm not comfortable with. I don't know what I was going to do. And the only thing I could do was I cried out to God and said, God, I can't do this alone. I can't do this alone. I need you in my life. Without you, I don't know what I'm going to do because I need you. And so during that time, God was, was, talking to me. He was showing me different ways. And lastly, and this is the last point, and it says, Jesus values obedience. Jesus values obedience. As we see in the Old Testament, we see different characters that were obedient or some that were not. We see Jonah, when he was supposed to go to a specific city, he decided to run away from God. He ran. And it says that in verse uh, uh, Jonah chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, it says, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness had come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish and to flee from the Lord. He tried, he ran. He ran from God. He wasn't being obedient where he was supposed to do, and instead he turned and ran. We see in Exodus with Moses, when he was being called to go do something, he responded with this. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, he said, it basically states that they will not believe in him or listen. Exodus 4.10, he tried to state that he was a slow to speech or an eloquent speaker. Verse 13 in chapter 4, he, he even says, Lord, please send someone else. I've been there. I've been there. I, I've felt that way. I've been, man, I don't know what I'm doing. Please, just let me do my thing. And let me, let me do what I need to do. Don't do this. Don't send me this way. But God instead showed me something better. Because it, it may be something that I was afraid of at that point. Maybe something I was nervous about because I felt inexperienced, unqualified. But the Lord says, I will be with you. Wherever you go, I am going to be with you. And I'm going to help you every step of the way. And after praying through this and talking with different leaders and trying to figure out what to do, I finally changed my major to youth ministry to serve in full-time vocational ministry. And through that, the Lord has opened up so many different doors, opportunities to serve, opportunities to grow in my own faith in the Lord. And because of that, I have managed to graduate Liberty University with a bachelor's degree in youth ministry. And I would not have been able to do that if it wasn't for the Lord. The Lord was with me every single step of the way. And what the biggest thing I learned was that I needed to value what Jesus valued. And my question to you is what do you value? What do you value? Do you value what Jesus values? Do you value people, which means community, support, and unity? Do you value the word, which could be memorizing scripture, challenging it, learning it, being in community with one another to, in order to learn more about scripture? Do you value prayer? 
is that having communication so that the enemy doesn't put you in isolation, but rather you have community with the Father. Do you value obedience? Where if God calls you to do something, will you be willing to say, here I am, send me. Isaiah 6, 8, here I am, send me. Because wherever you go, God is going to be with you every step of the way. Do you value that? Or do you value your own, do you value your own ambitions, your own dreams, your own desires? And I want you to pray about that. And this is really what I want to leave you guys with. And it's, if you guys have a piece of paper or a journal or a note card or even your phone, I want you guys to pull it out. And I want you guys to write down these four words. I want you guys to write down people, word, prayer, and obedience. And so when we see that, I want you guys this week, every time you go out or every day, I want you guys to think about how to serve people, how to value the word, how to value prayer, how to value obedience. And maybe that could be you, you pray for a neighbor who is an unbeliever or is going through something really hard. Maybe it's you go out to lunch with your friend who you haven't seen in a while and you just say, hey, man, I love you. Just saying that can go a long way. Maybe it's, maybe it's memorizing scripture. Alethe and I, have gone, we're going through a plan right now where we're doing the whole Bible in a year. That's what we're going to go through. We're going to go through the whole Bible in a year. And so we're so excited to be a part of that journey because we, we want to value the word the way Jesus valued the word. And we want to value people and value prayer and value obedience in so many different ways. So that's why I want to leave you here this with you guys is throughout this week, I want you guys to write down Anytime you guys do something like that, see how you are valuing people the way Jesus valued people, how you're valuing the word in different ways. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer, and um, we'll take it from there. So Father, thank you so much for this amazing day and this amazing opportunity that we can be here together as a community. Father, you are so, so good. You are a good, good father. And Father, I pray that as we go about the rest of our day, that, Father, we can value what you value, that we can love what you love. And, Father, that we can grow more to be like you. Father, that is one step at a time. And Father, that is a lifelong process. But, Father, we want to be, be a part of that. Father, we want to be with that, and we never want to leave that. Father, you are always with us, and we love you for that. You give us blessings that sometimes we don't even see but we praise you for what we see and what we can't see. Father, thank you so much for everything you've given us and everything that you continue to do in our lives. Father, I ask you for your blessings. And Father, I pray that everybody, that they can remain warm on this cold winter day and that they can have just smi uh, uh, smiling and bright faces as they go about the rest of their day. Father, I ask us all in the precious name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Matthew. Um... I just want to let you know two things that my subcommittee looked at that we said we want to see what we're looking for in a candidate is someone who has a clear calling of God and also someone who has a love for our kids as we bring them into our church. And that, that's just been seen time and time again with how Matthew and Alethea have uh, handled themselves in our meetings. I will be sending out an email with the announcements that were in the bulletin, the YouTube link of this recording, and uh, also songs. Uh, Matthew had requested a song that we were going to close with. The praise team, I didn't tell you, Matthew, they went out and learned it right away, and they were going to lead it at the end of the service. Uh, so it was just exciting. So I'll send out the, the link that you and I have been sending back and forth so people could see those songs. But we thank you all for joining us. Um, pray for next week. We're supposed to have a, a, a meeting after church, and I'm already seeing snow in the forecast for next Saturday night into Sunday. Just Lord willing. Everything is Lord willing. So let me close in prayer now, and thank you all for signing on. Father, I thank you. I thank you that um, you do want us to be Christ-like. You want us to be like your son. Jesus, you came to make us like your son, uh, make us like yourself. Jesus, you came to send your spirit to give us the power.
to do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We thank you, dear Trinity, for your love for us and the community you seek to build in the church and particularly in our church. I continue to pray for your leading in our lives as we go forward. For however long you have the church here on this earth, we want to be faithful and we pray that lives will be touched and changed because of the, the sharing of your word and the love of your people for others. Thank you. Thank you for the power of prayer. And, and we pray for growing obedience until that day you return. I praise you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.